We are live with Unleashed, and uh, we are the resistance. And what does that even mean, we are the resistance? You know, if you keep listening to these podcasts week after week, you're going to learn what that's really all about. And um, I'm glad to have all of you guys listening because I, I've been meeting so many guys, whether it be at, you know, speaking events or outdoor shows or guys messaging me, that this podcast has been a real uh, shot of testosterone in a way, kind of a thing where it picks them up and it gets them back on their feet again when they've kind of really felt, you know, beat down and alone and all that stuff. So we're glad you're here. We're glad you're listening. And man, tighten your seatbelt. This is going to be a really fun one today. So let's start off, Eric. What do we have today? Yeah, I've got a question from Mark from Alberta, Canada, Alberta. And I kind of botched that. Alberta. Uh, Alberta. Uh, Mark wants to know, what is the hairiest, scariest uh, hunting scenario that you've been in? The hairiest, scariest hunting scenario? Um, you know, I, I there, there's been a couple of them that were really nasty. I got charged by a bison one time. I was going through a wooded area in, um, where was it? Was it in southwestern or something, south central Oklahoma, and I didn't see it. I mean, it was standing still. And I, it's weird to say that, but it was it was like um, I was hog hunting. It was in a, I think it was in the summertime. And it was, uh, it was just crazy. I, I'm trying to remember the whole situation, but I walked up and all of a sudden I'm like 15 yards away from this thing and it's paw on the ground. And I'm like, oh, and I had one other guy with me. His name was Jake Reese. And he, we start, you look at each other and I'm like, go, you know, and so we take off. And here's the funny thing. Um, the one company that, that sponsors me, their name is Atsco. They make all kinds of waterproofing and scent killer and UV killer that you can get the UV dyes and brighteners out of your clothing. And we're standing out there laughing because we realized what could have just happened. And I go, hey, I've got this scent killer spray, this stuff, uh, the no odor that this company makes. Let me spray it down and see how close I can get to that bison. He looks at me and he goes, you're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, last week we talked about, you know, sponsorships in the outdoor industry and that kind of stuff. That's how stupid you can be when you're really trying to get a good story for one of these companies. And I'm and sorry, I, I did do it, but I didn't get as close as I you know, I just kind of kept my distance, but the scariest, hairiest thing wasn't actually hunting. It was fishing. And I had, I had two of them. One of them, I was, uh, we had been filming on the water on the Russian river in Alaska. And I think I've shared this story a long time ago, but it was one of the guys who was with us, um, got away from us, didn't, couldn't find his way back out. And we, we couldn't find him. And by the time we got up over the top of the hill, it was dark and there's bears everywhere. As a matter of fact, I had to pull my 44 Magnum on that trip because I had a bear push me off the water about 20 yards and I'm talking to him and, and he didn't listen. And so that night I had to go back down on the water and one buddy went one way. I went the other way and we're trying to find, we thought it was no longer going to be a you know search and rescue. We thought it was a recovery mission. You know, we thought he was dead. I found, I, I shared this before, I found a tackle box spilled everywhere that no one picked up the stuff. And so I thought I was going to walk up on a bear pile. But the scariest probably would have been, um, it was in the episode called Lost at Sea that we did. It was maybe like episode three or somewhere around there uh, where we w were out to sea. We're, you know, we're 40 miles out in the open ocean and throw a bearing and we get stuck and have to make our way into this little, um, little three hole bay was the name of the place off the Ialic Peninsula. And we were stuck there for like five or six days. And at that point, when no one's finding you, and you've got 800 feet water, you know, where you've been out there, that's spooky. I mean, when you're out in the big ocean and you're in a small boat, that's, that's scary stuff. I uh, mean, I just think about, you know, we just had a couple of Navy SEALs go, one guy fell off and the other SEAL jumped in to save him and they haven't found him so far. So, you know, praying that's, for their family. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's no good. But yeah, that would be it. You know, there was a, a, a book that I had read right about that time, and that would have been probably around 2010 or 11 when that happened. But this, if, if some of you out there ever heard of um, Sir Ernest Shackleton, he was the captain of a boat called the Endurance. And this, this book that I read, it was called the Endurance. I think you can find the movie still like on Netflix or something with this. But I have a saying, and you guys have heard me say it before, that I used to come up with on some of these crazy uh, adventures, that adventure begins when plans go bad. And that's 
that's exactly what happened like on this story, but it's way over the top of anything that I have, have ever been a part of or experienced. You know, I've had some really crazy stuff happen. You know, like I said, I've been charged by um, bears, um, both black and brown bears. That bison we just talked about, I was charged by a red stag, uh, a wounded whitetail, which is crazy. My buddy had shot it, and when I came up on it, it was hiding behind a log, and it came right at me. Um, I had a 400-pound Russian boar uh, come right at me. That was another one. I mean, there's been a few others, but... Nothing, none of that stuff really compares to the, to the feelings like I just talked about, you know, in Alaska on those two different trips. And it was my, my former college roommate, Ralph, um, his dad was a bush pilot up there and, and I would go up with him either. We worked on a salmon boat one summer together, you know, that was his life. And, you know, we flew up into the Iliamna mountain range and we had some really great, you know, um, black bear and caribou hunts up there. And we got stuck. I mean, on one of those adventures, we were stuck there for like about five or six days because his dad couldn't pick us up. And we got socked in. And, you know, you've got brown bears here. You know, they're following these caribou herds. And I had one of those things happen where I um, was waiting for a plane to pick me up. And I was the only one there. And I had a big brown bear that was circling me. It was pretty, pretty spooky stuff, especially when, you know, if, if, if their plane goes down, no one knows where you are. But the whole thing with the, the being lost at sea I was just talking about. You know, and as crazy as unnerving as that story was, it really is a grain of sand, grain of sand uh, compared to what Ernest Shackleton um, experienced in his transatlantic expedition, which was back in the early 1900s. And he had a, a saying, and it was, difficulties are just things to overcome after all. Well, when you hear this story and you think about him saying difficulties are just things to overcome after all, this blows them all out of the water. He was the captain of the Endurance, and one of the greatest survival stories of all time was his um, Imperial Transatlantic Expedition, which was from 1914 to 1916, and it was, it was also known as the Endurance Expedition. That was their boat, and I think this, you know, I forget whether it was made in Norway, but it had like four-foot-thick wooden hull on this because they were going to be going through ice. You think about how thick, you know, four feet, I think it was four feet, uh, of wood that really is. That's how much you know, they had to have on that so that it wasn't going to sink the ship. So it was, it was one of those things back then they thought it was kind of like the Titanic in a way, kind of unsinkable. But what they would end up facing, um, you'll, you'll hear in just a minute kind of what happened with this. But his, his accomplishment as a leader, um, you know, it started back with his selection of the crew that he was going to have on the Endurance. And he handpicked some, like some of the members, including two that had served him, you know, for years before, on a previous expedition, but to recruit the rest. And I think it was 28 men that he needed to have all together. I think that's right. Um, he posted this, this notice and this is really great. This is what he put out there. Now, can you imagine you're looking for like a, you know, a job, whether you're going to be on a ship or whatever you're doing. And here's word for word, what he posted men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, Constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. That's it. That's like, that would be what would want to make you sign up. But his, um, that recruitment notice was brutally honest about, you know, what they could be, be facing. And when the, uh, when the crew members, you know, encountered all the above conditions, you know, they accepted them as best they could, you know, because they had been forewarned. But these men were not an uncommon breed. Like, get this, over 5,000 men applied for that job after reading that, which is like, it's, it's like, a, like a suicide voyage from what he had posted. Um, but these men, what they were, they wanted to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And, and we, we've talked about that. You know, men are attracted to being something bigger than yourself. And they understood that in order to accomplish this great adventure, they were going to have to endure weeks, months, and it ended up becoming even almost years of being uncomfortable. You know, they were willing to leave the safety um, of the harbor because they understood that that's not what ships are for. If you want to make a difference, you want your footprint in, in eternity, you know, you've got to be willing to take risks. Um, and we've talked about, you know, are you willing to take a risk to get to where you want to be? Uh, last week when we had Colin Cottrell on here, we were talking about, you know, are you willing to have that vision and then follow through with what you're going to need to do to get to that place? His was about, you know, getting in better shape, losing the weight he wanted to do. But you've got to, you've got to be able to leave the safety of, of the harbor. So eventually, um, this, this 
voyage, you know, when they when they went down to the um, Antarctic, you know, they 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 couldn't get to where they wanted to be. I think it was I I think it was the name of the island that they they stayed at for quite a while before they they could finally go. And when they did, um, the lead that they were kind of following through the ice began to close in on them, which is spooky. I mean, I've seen these leads and they can be really really small. And when they close, they're closed. But eventually, you know, the endurance became track trapped in uh, in pack ice, and. You know, after being there for for quite a while, um, they realized they weren't going anywhere, which is really neat because they had a bunch of dogs. I forget how many dogs. I mean, they had um, dog teams because when they were going to be, you know, getting to this place, they were going to be getting their sleds out and going across um, uh, the Antarctic. But when the ship got trapped, morale after a realizing they were going to be stuck there for the winter, began to go down. And what Shackleton did was pretty neat. He had them knock, like knock some of the walls out on the inside of the boat so they could have one big room where everyone could be together. And they would play music in there. They'd play games. It was something to really keep their um, endurance you know, up, their, their morale. And he led them in, in an amazing way. His, they, they, the book says that his calm and confidence in the more dire circumstances um, were so heartening to his crew. Uh, commenting on, on Shackleton's reaction to their inability, this is out of the book, uh, commenting on Shackleton's reaction to their inability to free the endurance from the ice, Alexander Macklin, the ship's doctor, said, it was at this moment Shackleton showed one of his sparks of real greatness. He did not show the slightest sign of disappointment. He told us simply and calmly that we would have to spend the winter in the pack. I mean, I don't know how I would react, you know, hearing that, except that it is a reality. You have to face reality. And the beautiful thing was he was with a band of brothers and they were all facing it together. And so each one of these guys, remember, they're, they're gifted in different ways. And that's why they got hired um, to be able to go on this voyage. So w- rather than wanting to be the hero in the story, each one knew that they were the hero in the story, given what their gifting was, that if each one of them could 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 follow through with what they did well, they would stand a chance of being able to survive. But after months um, spent in these makeshift camps on the ice, um, you know, as it continued in its northward drift, the party took uh, to the lifeboats um, because they realized that that there was going to be a lot of problems happening here. They got the lifeboats out. And the ship at this point, the ice, when that lead had closed in, it lasted for quite a while, but eventually it, it couldn't take the pressure. Of, of this ice. I can't even imagine how bad that pressure would have been. And it crushed her hull. And that's when they had to, you know, abandon ship. And I mean, some of the stories when they were making their way across the ice, pushing these lifeboats, because they knew they were going to eventually need these in order to save their life. There were these, um, oh, what are those seals called? Leopard seals that will actually hunt you and kill you. They had to have a lookout watching these things. And uh, I think they had a 30 out six or whatever it was that they would be shooting these was when they would attack. But it wasn't just the ice pack. Now they've got these leopard seals, you know, coming after them. And the wind chill temperature, you know, was crazy. You know, I, I, I wish I could remember. I didn't write this down, but it seemed like there were times that it got down to like 60 below zero with where they were. Um, I mean, straight temperature, some really crazy stuff. But Shackleton, uh, he, had, he took this, this crew that he had, 28 men, and they took the lifeboats and they put in and they, they were able to get away and they got to an island called Elephant Island. Now, there's nothing on Elephant Island. There's a bunch of seals and, and rocks and that kind of stuff. But it was the first land that they were able to get to and when, they, when these leads had opened up and they were able to get out of there. And the... the uh, this open boat that they had, they called it the James Caird. And what they did with this lifeboat, he took some of the wood that they had with him and they and they disassembled some other things and they made a deck on the top of this small lifeboat. And he took five of his 28-man crew. Now get this. They sailed for 800 miles with the other guys still back there on Elephant Island. They took over 800 miles in an open boat journey in this boat called the James Caird to reach South Georgia Island, um, which would ve- eventually was going to lead to the rescue of this whole crew and bring another um, and bring an end to their 22 month um, expedition, 22 months being out there like this. But it was adversity that drove these men to defeat the unimaginable and Shackleton and his crew. The reason they were saved is because they faced the adversity. I mean, they had to, they, they weren't really given a choice. 
It was, you know, if you're, it's live or die, what are you willing to do? And they had to face the dangerous truth of these circumstances. And the beautiful thing was that every one of these guys were willing to, to risk doing something different, getting out of their comfort zone, you know, getting to that place where the mind tells the body, you're doing this when the body doesn't want to do it. That's that survival mode, you know, that, that we get kicked into. You know, I talk on here a lot of times about, you know, challenges or gifts. Well, this would be one of those great examples that the challenge that they faced is what ended up saving their life because it called them up to a different different level. Um, you know, I, I speak a lot for men's outreach events over the year. I'll probably speak, you know, 40 to 60 somewhere in that time by the time you take in game dinners and men's retreats and churches and different things. And these guys that are coming through the doors, you know, a lot of them would never darken the door of a church. And we talked about wanting to be a part of something bigger like these guys were. And these guys show up and we've talked about the hunting industry like we did last week and how guys love being a part of something like that. I mean, we talked about we are the resistance on this podcast and we are a part of a family. That's what we are, brothers in Christ. And so these, these you know, these wild beast feasts or wild game dinners, um, you know, the intent is to wake men up through the door of adventure. And then, you know, hopefully invite them, you know, into a relationship with Christ at the end of the night. But you know, when, I'm, when I'm talking with these hosts, when they first call me over the phone to, to, like, to book me for an event, almost every host tells me, you know, Brent, make sure to give them the good news. Because you, know, you get a lot of guys out there, all they want to do is talk about hunting and wow everybody, which really becomes all about me if I do that. Um, I mean, John Maxwell told me one time years ago, he said, Brent, remember, your job when you get up there is to add value to other people. And he says, if you do that, he says, you'll be right on track. He says, you won't even get nervous because you're so focused on, on, on delivering them the good news. But a lot of times you'll find that there's many of these churches that aren't really prepared. They don't even know what to do with these men who come after the event's over and the good news has been shared. And a lot of time, many don't even know what the good news, to be honest with you, and I, I don't mean this to sound like when I'm saying that the good news, they, they believe in Jesus and they want to share that he can save you from your sin. But it's not really that much talked about the relationship, you know, that relationship point of view that they, they need to know about that God wants to have with them. You know, they'll promote good works, you know, ahead of the relationship. And it, it, sometimes it becomes more like, you know, you know, don't drink, don't cuss, don't chew, and don't go with girls that do, right? And one of my pet peeves, you know, is like this, too. When I hear like a worship leader say to, you know, the congregation, you know, Holy Spirit, we invite you to be in this place. Okay, newsflash, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is already in you. His spirit came into your spirit the moment you truly believed. And many churches have become so refined and religious and they lack the skills to take men to the next level than other than maybe things like, you know, flipping pancakes once a month on a Saturday morning or accountability groups where honestly, a lot of guys, if they don't have the relationship and they're getting the religious side of things, they feel like they're reporting to the parole officer and guys don't want to do that. They need to know that where they're going to be going is a safe environment. Like this crew of the Endurance, we're all working together. Um, they, they want to know that they're a part of something bigger than themselves that has a purpose and a mission, which is not only knowing God, but showing up for each other. And if we don't know how to get into guys' worlds, if you know our church out there and you're thinking about, you know, how can we reach guys? And all you're doing is, is, is getting these guys maybe flipping pancakes or, you know, having them tell their deepest, darkest sin so that they can kind of get it off their chest. You're, you're really under-equipping them. And it's like carrying a 338 wind mag into the wilderness, right? But never taking the time, you know, to load the gun or practice how you're going to handle things if a thousand-pound grizzly decides to chew on your ears. I read a book um, a long time ago. It was by um, Erwin Raphael McManus. It was called The Barbarian Way. And, I, and I've got it here. And he says on this one uh, page, because we were talking about, you know, sharing the good news. He says, so what is this good news? The refined version goes something like this. Jesus died and rose from the dead so that you can live a life of endless comfort, security, and indulgence. But really, this is a bit too developed. Usually it's more like this. If you'll simply confess that you're a sinner and believe in Jesus, you'll be saved from the torment of eternal hellfire, then go to heaven when you die. But either case results in our domestication. Did you hear that? Either of those results in our domestication. You know, I talk a lot about how men and little boys want to know they're, they're, they're dangerous for good. They're someone to be reckoned with. 
you know, our big question, do I have what it takes? But like I said, either one of those is going to end a domestication. One holds out for life to begin in eternity, and the other one makes a mockery out of life. You know, eternity starts the moment that you truly believe and Christ comes in. That's the beginning of your eternal life. And the whole point that McManus, you know, he's making here is that we are running out and we're talking about this great news and we're ending our conversation with, and if you don't receive Christ, you're going to burn in hell. Well, scaring men into a relationship with God is not the good news as you can never truly love someone that you're deathly afraid of. Let me say that again. Scaring men into a relationship with God is not good news as you can never truly love someone that you're deathly afraid of. You know, a woman will marry someone if they were to put a gun to her head, but it doesn't mean that she's going to be in love with them. God wants to be in a relationship with us so much so that he died for it. He took the bullet. The tragic, you know, uh, truth is that really only about one out of every 18, I think that's like five and a half percent of men have ever been taught, you know, how easy it is to live a life full of the good news and then going and teaching other people about it. Very few men have ever truly been discipled. And that not only includes men sitting like in church on Sunday mornings, that includes pastors, church staff as well. You know, it, while I'm speaking at men's retreats, I'll usually ask this question. Uh, how many of you have ever really had another man coach you or teach you about God? And I don't mean in some religious accountability performance-based group. I mean man-to-man, the authentic and real stuff. You know, the kind that says, you know, I know your stuff, but I'm not going to judge you and I'm not going to shame you for it. I'm going to stick with you no matter how long it takes. You know, the only way that we can do that when we can get into someone's world who's really struggling. You know, I had a friend, um, you know, years ago that had been caught up in uh, an affair and it wasn't all the people on the outside that, that threw him under the bus. You know, they were gossiping, shaming, shunning, judging, all this stuff. It was being able to go to him and say, brother, I am here. I love you. I'm so sorry you bought into those lies. Um, I understand how we can all buy into lies. You know, I've bought into my own. I've shared that in, on this podcast before. <laughs> But I'm, I'm not talking about a man simply encouraging you to go to church in those kind of instances, you know, to get baptized, you know, to join an accountability group or pray more. I'm talking about finding someone who's going to teach you how to walk away when you, when you want to, like, lock your wife in a closet for a few hours, right? When, when you, there's, maybe she's been nagging you about something. Um, you know, how do you love your wife and be able to hear the voice of God, you know, like, when you haven't had sex in six months, you know, when, when, you're, when there's something going on in the marriage and say that that's maybe one of your, your love languages is physical touch, which for most men, that is pretty high on the radar. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you walk through all this, this stuff? Cause it is hard, you know, being able to hear the voice of God and find contentment and peace, you know, when your world around you is kind of falling apart when you haven't had that intimacy with your wife and maybe she's not interested and maybe it's been going on for a while and you're beginning to feel like you don't have what it takes. There's must be really something wrong with you or you're questioning, you know, is she in love with someone else? Um, you're getting frustrated. And what ends up happening is guys, when we don't know their identity comes from Christ and we get into a situation where we can get angry with our wife who in an unhealthy relationship, we've given her our identity in other words, we're getting our worth and value from her. What ends up happening is you're going to get frustrated. You're going to feel less than, and you're going to start to feel tempted to try to find other outlets for those frustrations. And staying in another man's world, you know, if he's given into those temptations like porn or, you know, even having an affair, um, it's so impo- important to be able to do that. Um, Jesus did that. Look at the woman caught in adultery. Look at the woman at the well. Look at the tax collector. I mean, all these things. He didn't distance himself. He moved forward. He still spoke truth, but he did it out of love. And when a person knows that you truly care about them, no matter what, they're going to be able to open up with you because it's a safe place. And that's a lot of what discipleship looks like. That's how we can find a way to understand how much God loves us. And then to be able to untangle all these lies we're buying into being able to use, you know, the word. Um, Oh, what was that movie? 
uh, Jerry Maguire, is that the, that was uh, Tom Cruise? And Renee Zellweger, I think is what it was. You know, that you had me at hello, you know, that whole thing. The one line that drives me nuts in that movie is, you complete me. It's like, you know, your, your spouse can't ever complete you, right? Only God can. And when we give them that kind of power to complete us, we've also given them that kind of power to destroy us. I'm not saying don't love your, your wife with everything you have. Do that. But remember that your identity doesn't come from her. And the more you begin to understand where your true identity comes from, the less you're going to be needy from her to try to get all those needs met. And the more you're going to be able to love her right where you are. Well, guess what? When your wife really begins to feel like, um, you're loving her well without trying to get something in return, chances are you are going to get something in return. It's just beautiful the way that, that God made all that stuff to be. Um, you know, so why don't guys just talk, you know, to each other and help one another? Um, because guys are quiet. You know, we, we just don't talk about this kind of stuff because, frankly, I think many of us feel like we're weak. Um, you know, if we have unhealthy emotions or, or we're struggling with something and something that I've, I've noticed in some of my, my guests recently, we got into conversations, you know, off the mic. And some of the things they said was, dude, do you ever struggle with loneliness? Yeah. And I'm guessing you do too. And we've, we've never really been taught, you know, how do we deal with that? Because there's really only two emotions that, that men um, are acceptable to be able to, to display. One is anger because it's masculine, right? I'm full of testosterone. I can display anger. And the other one is joy, like at a football game. Yeah. But any other emotion you can think of, usually it's considered, you know, not masculine. And in the, in the culture we live in now, men are so emasculated for being masculine that they've just kind of gone quiet. And that's where the enemy wants you to be. He wants you to get quiet, to not have that brother to be able to talk to. And, you know, I was, I talked um, on last week's podcast briefly just about, you know, growing up and being in some of the different martial arts. And here's the thing. You can be a black belt in the dojo, but you can become a white belt when it comes to conflict resolution, like with your wife, with your boss. So, you know, through, through all this, the stuff that I've gone through in my life, one of the things that has hit me, the enemy loves to do is, you know, I discovered that I had a real fear of failure. Um, I was, I was scared to death that I wasn't going to be good enough. I still struggle with that. Even as much as I know the word and I talk about it, the enemy knows those you know, little cracks in the, in the, in the drywall or whatever to kind of seep through and, and kind of get into my mind and make me feel like I'm not going to be good enough. And when I start to feel that way, I feel like a failure. That's one of the main ingredients that keep us from connecting and learning from one another within our own spiritual lives. You know, we're afraid of looking stupid. We're afraid, afraid of not being smart enough, you know, or tough enough. Or even like we talked about, you know, give them the good news. We're afraid we're not holy enough. If you knew the, if you knew that ace in the closet sin that I had, well, guess what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God knows what that ace in the hole was. That you've never told anybody else, but Jesus died for that sin. And the beautiful thing I love is when we confess um, it's a done deal. We are forgiven. We were forgiven. Like I said, you know, God transfigured us. He didn't just transform us. When he took our sin, he took every sin. But men, you know, we don't want to do anything where we're going to look like uh, afraid or we're afraid we're not going to, we're going to look stupid. Um, we're not going to be enough, you know, for these other guys. And we bought into this lie, um, that we have to have another man's respect in order to feel good enough about ourselves. Um, and as, and as long as, as long as a, a man's respect, we have to have that and we feel less than if we don't have it, discipleship's not going to happen. You think about how many men have never been discipled, but they, they're afraid to tell anybody because they don't know the word. They don't know how to apply the word. So they feel like they're not good enough. So they're never going to ask the question, would you walk with me? Would you disciple me? Because somehow we feel weak. We feel like we're not good enough. But the beautiful thing is 
when we're on a team, when you think about the endurance and those men that were all together, when you're on a team and you have a coach, right, like a basketball or football or whatever, you know, we pretty much have to accept the idea that the coach knows more than, than we do, or at least they can teach us something. And you do not know as much as what the coach knows in, in a lot of areas. And that's really going to help you in the long run when you have a teachable spirit, when you're willing to step forward and say, I don't know how to do this. Can you help me? That, to me, is the sign of a strong man. It's not the man who stands up, holds his fist in the air, puffs his chest out. It's the man who can get down on his knees or ask those questions. I'm struggling and I need your help. And if that's you right now, man, I want to encourage you because there is no shame. As a matter of fact, I have more respect for you when you can do that. We, we don't have to be top dog. Um, to me, the top dog is the guy that says, you know what, I, I want to keep a teachable spirit because I want to learn so I can pass that on, whether it be my sons, my daughters, whoever else. So, you know, like in this fight to be the best, you know, of all these manly men that we can be, when we fear less than one another, you know, we, we flare our nostrils, we, we stomp our hooves, and we try to take control of our territory. It's, it's been that way for ages. I mean, this isn't a new thing. And my question is, if you're that guy, how's that working for you? You know, it's time to realize that being a man of God means more than winning or doing good things. It means that you are willing to take a chance on something else, to risk doing something different with the goal of getting closer to God and to one another. And in turn, it's a beautiful thing because we get to live a life off the hook. I know it's hard for guys to keep from, you know, wanting to be the best. I get that. You know, it's a part of our nature. But there's other ways to do it, too. You know, men want to fight with fire, but that's not how Jesus did it. You know, make no mistake about it. Jesus, Jesus wasn't afraid to fight for a worthy cause. You know, when he drove the, the, the money changers out of the temple, and, and ultimately he's, he's fighting for all of us against evil with that, his life he laid down for us. But he picked his battles wisely. And here's the thing. He did it without sin. How do we accomplish that? Well, first, he realized the battle wasn't with the rulers and authorities. His battle was against the true enemy, Satan. He knew Satan's ability to deceive others, you know, and to cast darkness over their hearts and minds. And Jesus knew the real battlefield was being fought in the minds where we all struggle with men. And he was a master at winning this battle. His weapons weren't the typical weapons of warfare. He chose his father's word. And no matter what the person's sins were, he loved them right where they were without abandoning them. That's what Shackleton did. You know, in this whole voyage of these 28 men, everything that he did was planned to help them survive. And eventually what's so great about the story is he never lost a single man. You know, Jesus knew truth. He used empathy. He asked questions. He would tell stories to get into others' worlds. How many guys have I met um, that they don't want you to know their story because they're afraid of what you might think of them rather than I want you to know my story because I want you to know what God has done through it. Because that story offers encouragement. It brings hope. You know, it, it shows how God loves us unconditionally. And that's one of the greatest ways to defeat the enemy is by telling our story and what God did through it. Because if we don't tell it, God doesn't get the glory. I really want to encourage you to, to sit down, look in the mirror, be honest with yourself, with your story, and think, how can this story be, be told, be shown, to be able to change the people that come to me that God sends my way, that I can love on them in the way that Jesus loved? You know, Jesus didn't need others to be like him, right? He knew that the truth was going to set them free. So he didn't care what they thought about him. He spoke truth to sinners, busy, sinners because he cares more about their character than he did their comfort. Same thing with us. God cares more about your character than he does your comfort. It's just like when you have a child. You know sometimes being a parent means you're going to have to do some things to help that child, but down the long run, it's really going to be for their benefit. It's not always fun, but down the road, it's what you're going to need to have. And he, Garrett, or God was more concerned with that. Um, he understood that sin, here's the thing. Jesus understood that sin was just an attempt to get a legitimate need met in an illegitimate way. 
Some of you might be going, okay, well, wow, it's way bigger than that. Well, think about it. Why do, do any of us sin? We have a need that somehow wasn't being met. And so we try to meet it in an illegitimate way. But the way that Jesus accomplished it was like no one in history had ever done it before. He didn't give in to the temptation to tell someone what they wanted to hear for the sake of being popular. Jesus was not about being famous. He was about laying down his own life. And in that, he was absolutely fearless. Through his death and and resurrection, he gave us what we need to defeat the enemy's lies because he gives us his identity. So let me go back to Shackleton here as we start to wind down a little bit. Um, Shackleton, like I said, he survived and his men were saved because he kept choosing to do something different. He didn't stay stuck. When I said, how's that working for you? Chances are, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, you're doing that because nothing has changed. So my question is, are you willing to do something different? Are you willing to ask to be discipled? Are you willing to be able to meet with someone and, and ask for it to be a safe environment where you can share the worst about yourself. When you have that place where you know you're going you know you're going to be loved no matter what, it's so much easier to be able to get through this stuff because we can talk about what's really happening. But with Shackleton, you know, it wasn't sheer muscle that was going to break them free of the ice. Um, withstand, you know, like negative 100 degree temperatures. And I think there was like 100 mile winds, you know, and all those dark, lonely nights. Because, man, in the wintertime, I mean, you have like four hours of daylight. But it was hope that saw them through. It was hope that came through the leader that they trusted that he would do no matter whatever it was going to take to help them find their way home. And the captain of the endurance, you know, he was training men how to take on the harsh realities, how to confront fear, how to band together, you know, how to take risks in order to survive the ruthless forces in that dangerous world, and they had to do it together no matter what. So where do you have those men in your life that you could say would be your crew? If you knew that you had to have men show up in your life right now, no matter what the circumstance, whether it's a loss of a job, loss of a marriage, loss of a child, loss of your parents, any of those things that leave you feeling afraid or ashamed or alone, do you have that crew? Are you willing to risk doing something different to find that crew? Because this life is a dangerous voyage. You are gonna have hardships. You are gonna have dark nights. And when you begin to understand your identity and through that identity, you do have what it takes and you surround yourself with a band of brothers, a crew like that, there is nothing that you cannot endure. If you get a chance, go on and watch that that movie, The Endurance. It's it's a powerful story of survival and and banding together as brothers. And that's exactly what we we are here. We are the resistance. And through that, when we band together, there's nothing we can't do through Christ who gives us strength. We'll see you next time.